This is Carl Schusterman. Um, I'm very proud to be here with uh, Chuck Cook, who used to be the president of the American Immigration Lawyers Association. And of course, Bernie Wolfstorff was also president of that organization. And uh, a, an attorney from his office, Richard Yem, will be on this uh, webinar with us. So uh, you've probably seen a lot of stories in the, in the press in the last couple days. And I'm going to let Chuck and, uh, and Richard uh, talk about what's been going on in the House of Representatives and so on and the Obama administration. But uh, in my view, having done this for almost 40 years, I don't think there's any reason to panic. Um, I think this is more PR than something that's really going to take back. I think that uh, since the immigration programs proposed by President Obama are financed by user fees, there's really no way for Congress to cut off the money. Uh, maybe they'll shut down the Department of Homeland Security for a couple days, but I think they'll probably back down before that happens. We'll, we'll see. But with, with that out of the way, uh, let me talk about uh, uh, part of the program that um, I think might be very interesting to those of you who have very close relatives who are citizens or permanent residents of the United States. And these are the provisional I-601A waivers of unlawful presence. Um, this is something that President Obama is proposing expanding very greatly, and hopefully it'll be somewhere in the next year that that happens. Um, who's eligible for this kind of waiver? Well, first of all, if you have to be in the U.S., and you have to be somebody who's ineligible to get your green card in the United States. We call that adjustment of status. And why, why would you be ineligible? Well, 90% of the time, it's for people who entered the United States unlawfully. But it also might be people who did enter the United States lawfully, uh, but have fallen out of legal status. They overstayed their status. They worked without permission. It could also be people that come on transit visas, um, maybe a fiancé visa. And uh, somebody's advancing these slides. I don't mean to, so I'm going to take them back. Um, uh, but if, if for any reason you are ineligible to get your green card in the U.S., you have to go abroad, usually back to your own country and apply for an immigrant visa. But if you have over 180 days of unlawful presence in the U.S., then you're going to be barred from coming back for three years. And if you have over a year of unlawful presence, you're going to be barred from coming back for 10 years. But there's a way to get around the bar. It's called a 601 waiver. And you have to show that certain qualifying family members would suffer extreme hardship if you were not allowed to come back to the U.S. for three or ten years. And this has been the law since 1997. The problem is, is that people would go abroad. Let's say I was married to a permanent resident or I was petitioned by my citizen brother and I had been here illegally for over a year. And I could show that I had certain relatives in the United States that would suffer extreme hardship, but I couldn't apply until I got back to the embassy in my country. And that process could take months. It could even take a year. And some of the applications were not done well, so they were denied. And then the people would have to appeal. So very quickly, back in 1997, 1998, people figured out, oh, my God, I heard a story of somebody who went over to Juarez, Mexico, or Manila, Philippines, or whatever country it was, and either they didn't come back or they were over there for months and months waiting for their application to be decided. So the alternative to that was people would just stay in the United States illegally and even though they were in line for a green card, which really helps nobody. So a couple of years ago, I think it was March 4th, 2013, President Obama said, look, if the only reason you need a waiver is because of unlawful presence, um, you can file 
the I-601A, a new form, in the United States before you leave. So that way, if you get a waiver, which they call a provisional waiver before you leave, then you only have to go out to your country for probably two or three weeks, get your green card, and come back. You don't have to sit out and be separated from your family for months and months at a time. And for those people who are worried about having their waiver denied, they know the waiver's already approved before they get on an airplane and go back to their country. Now that that program's worked so well that President Obama on November 20th, uh, 2014, in his latest speech about immigration, proposed expanding this provisional waiver program. So it's not just applying to immediate relatives. When we, the program hasn't started yet, but we're getting a lot of people coming into our office and there's a lot of advanced planning you have to do. So if you're eligible, you know, the time to see your lawyer is now, not when the program goes into effect. So uh, the waivers will apply not only to immediate relatives, but also to sons and daughters. Oh, well, let me explain who immediate relatives are. Immediate relatives are parents, spouses, and children of U.S. citizens. And when I say parents, I mean parents of sons and daughters who are over 21 years of age. Now President Obama would like to expand the program to include sons and daughters of U.S. citizens, even if they're not children, even if they're over 21, even if they're married. And he'd like to also include spouses and sons and daughters, unmarried, but whether or not they're adults, of green card holders. So this covers almost, well, pretty much covers all the... Uh, family-based categories except for, you know, brothers and sisters of U.S. citizens. Um, also, the Immigration Service, you know, what, what does extreme hardship mean? And I, I mean, I used to work for the Immigration Service, and I can tell you that, you know, the nice examiner, examiner A, would say, oh, yeah, you've, you've proved extreme hardship. Uh, you have to take your wife or your mother to the hospital. Uh, she doesn't have a driver's license, or you're the support for the family or something. And the examiner B, the tough guy next door, would say, oh, no, no, no. It has to be, you know, some relative who's dying of cancer, and without you, they're going to drop dead the next day, which obviously, obviously is, uh, you know, overreaching. So, you know, the good thing is you can apply in the U.S., but you should be careful. Right now, over a third, 34% of all these waivers are denied. So another thing that President Obama has proposed is that the USCIS, the agency that decides these waivers, clarify what extreme hardship means, come out with some standards that you as immigrants and your lawyers can know whether you qualify or not, so you don't have to waste a lot of money if you're not qualified. Um, and then I said these, these rules, they are not effective yet. I mean, we hope that this particular rule will be effective sometime in 2015. I think some pessimists these think it might be in 2016, but uh, I don't think so. Um, if you read the newspaper stories, you'll see that the uh, Congress is really arguing over the, the DACA and the DAPA program. They're not uh, arguing about this program. So I, I, I don't have much doubt that sometime in 2013, when the new guidelines and regulations come out, um, you'll be able to apply. But the important thing is it's going to take two or three months to put all the evidence together, the economic hardship, the uh, medical hardship, the emotional hardship. We usually have applications that are at least 100 pages long, and so far we haven't seen a denial yet. Um, so, you know, be careful who you go to. Just don't go to the cheapest lawyer around. And uh, I think a lot of people who've been stuck in the U.S., although they have priority dates, 
will be getting their green cards very soon under this new policy. And that, that's all I have to say today. Um, I'm, with that, I'm going to tur turn it over to my colleague, Chuck Cook. Thank you, uh, Carl. I, I sure appreciate your comments here. And uh, also, the, uh, the, the way you presented this, uh, it, the change in the, uh, uh, the regulation to expand it to include these family members uh, is a really wonderful thing. And I think uh, at the end of the day, uh, it will prove very beneficial to, uh, to lots of families. I want to talk about uh, the, the new programs and the expansion of the old programs that uh, President Obama has put into place uh, beginning soon. Yeah, and that's really the big question. When he announced on uh, January 20, uh, November 20th, I shouldn't forget that day because it's my anniversary, um, that uh, beginning six months from the date of the announcement, there will be a new program for parents of individuals who have been here for a certain period of time who have children who are born here or who are permanent residents, and an expansion of the DACA program three months later, uh, which of course is uh, February. Now the rumors that we're hearing is that the start dates for these programs will be February 15th and May 15th, uh, but the reality is we don't know yet and we do not have all the information. So let's take an opportunity here to, um, to really see uh, how this program works. Now, generally speaking, the first part of this program is the announcement and a series of measures to change these rules. Uh, the, uh, the most important, well, I'm not, I'm not good at the screen, am I? I have to make sure I get that properly here. Um, go to this DAPA screen here. So DAPA is uh, Deferred Action for Parental Accountability. It's one of those uh, acronyms they were apparently looking for something to go with uh, that was easy and found a word that kind of fit in, which in many ways doesn't make sense in the context of the application. The basic requirements I think most of us are familiar with. You must have been in the United States on November 20th, 2014. And as of that date, you must have been the parent of a US citizen or permanent resident. The age of the child is irrelevant. Whether the child was married or unmarried is irrelevant. You must have been continuously residing in the US since January 1, 2010. So for the previous essentially five years, you must have been in the United States without leaving. Next, you must have been here on the 20th of that year. And when you apply for DAPA, which looks like it'll be sometime around May 15th, 2015. And I think we can suppose that the continuous residence requirement will extend through May uh, 2015. You must also be not, and it's kind of a negative requirement, not an enforcement priority. And that means you must not be among the class of people that President Obama wants to deport or who he considers to be gangbangers, which is his favorite term in talking about people who should be kicked out of the United States. Now, as we move forward on the presentation, let's take a look at uh, uh, some of the specific requirements for DACA. Now, the DACA uh, process, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival, has been around now for almost two and a half years and has been very successful. Not, I would not say it's wildly successful. I would say it's been pretty successful. And the reason for that is President Obama announced that there, when he created DAP, uh, DACA back in June of 2015, that there would be 1.8 million people eligible to apply for DACA. Uh, when in reality, to date, only about 800,000, maybe 900,000 have applied. So less than half the number of people have applied for DACA up to this point. And of that number, so far, about just over, I think, 700, close to 800,000 have been approved. For these people, and it's not just kids, uh, there's been a remarkable boon to their life, a remarkable change to their life. For DACA, uh, with the Obama announcement, now instead of having to have been here before June 15, 2007, you must have been under the age of 16 and in the U.S. before January 1, 2010, which essentially means any later arrivals that didn't qualify previously, some will be able to qualify. Perhaps the biggest change, because I don't think the numbers between uh, June 07 and January 2010 are going to account for a lot of new arrivals for kids. But you will account for a lot of, given it was a recession, you will account for a lot of people with the lifting of the age maximum. 
Uh, before, you must have been under 31 uh, before June 15, 2010. And now there's no longer an age cap. This is very, very important for people because I personally have had a number of clients who come in who were 31 a few days before the announcement and who couldn't qualify, who now, upon the creation of the program, will be able to qualify uh, for, uh, for DACA. Now, we talked earlier about uh, the disqualifying factors for DAPA, and frankly, these are not much different from DACA's qualifying factors. First, if you are, have been convicted of a felony, now a felony is uh, that uh, for a state or local offense not involving immigration uh, status, and it's really any felony. And this is why when Carl talked about coming in early and preparing for DAPA, this is one of the reasons why you have to do this. If you have a conviction of any kind, whether it's a felony or misdemeanor, it is not wise to wait until May to talk to a qualified immigration lawyer to see whether that conviction will disqualify you and make you ineligible for DAPA. Now is the time to come in and see whether that conviction requires that you be denied DAPA, because now, with four months to spare before the start date of the application, there are possibilities in many states, including in California, where there have been recent changes in the law that make the changing of the convictions much more simple than they have been in years past. Now, not every jurisdiction around the country is the same, uh, but for many places, given recent Supreme Court precedent, it is possible, if you were improperly advised of the immigration consequences of a conviction, that you can have that conviction set aside. Now, of course, setting aside the conviction doesn't mean you're unconvicted. It simply means the, you go back to being a charged uh, person. If you have three misdemeanor convictions, other than traffic offenses, one of the problems we have where I live in the South is we find people that are picked up and arrested for what we call DWH, driving while Hispanic. Uh, and then they are arrested at that point for not having a driver's license, as if the officer had x-ray vision in the car with no other charges. Uh, those convictions will not matter for DAPA, and they do not matter for DACA. But other misdemeanors, such as possibly shoplifting, domestic violence, uh, DUIs, all of those will uh, disqualify you from relief under the system. Or one significant misdemeanor. Even one DUI is considered a significant misdemeanor under the rules and is one for which you can be denied DACA. So here are some significant misdemeanors. Conviction of a simple battery against a spouse. Now, it's not just the spouse. It can be domestic violence can be considered against any person of the same or opposite sex with whom you share an intimate relationship in most states. If you get convicted of sexual abuse, I can assure you that you not only are not eligible for DAPA, but should, should ICE become aware of who you are, you will be picked up. Unlawful possession or use of a firearm. Uh, I have had a, several people in the last couple of weeks come to see me that said, well, I haven't been convicted of anything other than I went hunting once and they, and they gave, me a, gave me a fine for uh, having a gun when I was undocumented. That may stop them from having uh, eligibility for DAPA. Drug sales, not possession, but drug sales will possibly bar you for relief. Possession of drugs, even something more than marijuana, may not, as long as it's only one, may not make you ineligible. Burglary or DUI will make you ineligible, certainly within the five years. And anything in which you are sentenced to 90 days or more in jail uh, may become a significant misdemeanor as part of this process. Now, I will tell you that DAPA applications are confidential, but they are not secret. Uh, thus, if somebody is denied for having a criminal conviction, that is one that is a higher level uh, criminal need for obtaining uh, DAPA, uh, for denying DAPA, it is possible that you will be turned over to ICE. Such as those categories are listed here. Now, what we also know about the criminal bars is they may not be a bar if sufficient time has passed. The memo that, that in which DAPA and DACA are created allows for a, length, a new length of time exception for DAPA individuals. Still not for DACA, because again, it's for kids, but maybe not for kids anymore with the expansion. But for DAPA individuals, there are now reasons that maybe you can give 
to show why you should that your serious misdemeanor, for example, should be overlooked by ICE and USCIS, and you should be granted DAPA relief. Again, this is why you want to talk to a lawyer now to see if you can begin building the case such that when the application period opens up, you will be able to submit our, an exemption request or an exception request from the bar that exists within DAPA. One of the things that we have found interesting so far is that we have heard nary a peep, not a sound, from our friends at DHS about the details of this program. I am afraid that this program will emulate the DACA program from two and a half years ago when President Obama announced a program in which 60 days later DACA would start and USCIS did not announce the rules on using DACA until the very day it began. Uh, now we do have the DACA expansion coming up in about three weeks uh, or I guess a month from now in February because today is the 15th of January. And we would hope that sometime before those four weeks from now, we would have DACA regulations, or in other words, DACA rules. But I, frankly, am planning not to have those until the 15th of February. And I'm likewise not planning to have the DAPA final rules until May. But we will see. Perhaps our friends at the Immigration Service can prepare us. Now, what we need to prepare, what do you need? You must have a valid passport from your country. If you do not have a valid passport, now is the time to get them. There are many countries in which it is very hard, while you're in the U.S. undocumented, to get a foreign passport. Now is the time to do that. You're going to need your birth certificates for you and your children, and your birth certificate, if not already in English, will need to be translated into English. If you are married and or divorced, you will need copies of those certificates as well. For any case, in which you have been arrested or detained or ticketed, it will be essential that you go to the court clerk where you paid your fine or where you were convicted and get a copy of your criminal convictions. In many states, this is called a disposition, along with proof that you've paid all your tickets, all your fines, and all your penalties. If you have had previous engagement with the Immigration Service, and by that I mean you've been arrested by immigration, you were detained at the border, you were deported. Now is the time to see a lawyer to get a copy of your immigration file from immigration. It's vitally important when filing for DAPA that your lawyer know everything immigration knows. And the only way for that to happen is to make sure they have your immigration file. Of course, if you've been to college or attended any schools here, you're going to need to get those because those are helpful in proving lawful presence in the United States. You also need to show documents. I think the best approach to this DAPA application is, is to be prepared to have a document, at least one, for every one of the 65 months between January 1 and 2010 and May 15, 2015. You're going to want to have leases, receipts, uh, payments for gas or electricity. You're going to want to show mail that you received at your address, other payments you've made for other things, the credit card bills. Many people have bank accounts. Bank accounts are particularly good at showing that you've been here because banks issue you a bank statement every month. So call your bank and say, I need my last 60 bank statements, and begin holding those until May. Now, I put affidavits from friends and relatives, neighbors, teachers, pastors, priests, individuals you have dealings with. Those are not particularly persuasive, but absent other evidence, I would certainly include those in an application. Because you must have children to qualify for DAPA, your children go to the doctor. Call your doctor and arrange to get the complete medical records of your children as well as the complete school records of your children. Because when you take your child to the doctor and enroll them in school, they indicate you are the parent and that you were there. If you have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, <laughs> Pinterest, all you have to do, what I love about Twitter, it tells you where you were when it was posted. Facebook, Instagram, it says where you were when you posted the account print it out and put it in your application. One of my favorite new ones is Redbox. If you rent videos from Redbox, back in the day it would be Blockbuster, but if Redbox, go to the Redbox website. Print out uh, your information about where and when you rented, uh, rented uh, movies. Again, it shows your United States. Pho uh, photographs. Now, photographs aren't particularly useful unless 
those photographs were taken with a phone that has GPS enabled. Because every photograph, particularly, for example, on an iPhone that's taken, embeds in the data the location where that picture was taken. And there are programs on the internet, and, and some good lawyers have them, to, to get that information off the picture. And you can show immigration, I was in New York when I took this picture, besides the fact that Times Square is behind me. There is no requirement that you have paid taxes. I hope you did, because it lowers my tax burden. But if you didn't, that's OK. Going forward, you must. But if you have done so and filed your returns, do not submit to immigration your tax returns. Instead, submit to immigration your tax transcripts. And you can get those by going to www.irs.gov. So there is only a limit, as, as far as your imagination is concerned, as to the type of documents to show that you're in the US. Many people have talked, and I've talked to over 1,000 so far. Some say, well, I'm a, I'm a stay-at-home mom. I don't have any documents. Not true. There are absolutely documents there with your kids, with their school, with your friends, with your email, with any piece of paper you can possibly imagine or create in the 21st century. Nobody goes unnoticed and unidentified in the 21st century. We do know that DACA costs $465. You should not be paying lawyers now to file your DAPA because there is no fee known. We don't know the process. We don't know the forms. We don't know what's required in detail. So nobody should be charging you, and you should not be paying money to anybody to prepare or to be in line for DAPA. What you should be doing is taking a consult, paying that fee, talking to the lawyer, getting your ducks in a row, and being prepared so that in May you can come forward and get that application filed. So now I'll turn the time back over to Rich uh, for his part of our presentation. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, very informative. I think especially that age cap being um, taken off the DACA is, is a huge it's, thing. It's a, it's a monumentally great thing, and we haven't talked yet about our friends in Congress, but I'm sure we'll get to that. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, that was one thing I was going to just go over very quickly. was basically, you may have seen recent news, you know, the House measure defies Obama on immigrants. Um, now, I think... As Carl was mentioning earlier, it looks like we're probably still OK. Um, this is still going to have to go through the Senate. And chances are it's going to get shot down there. And Obama's also said that he's going to, he wouldn't sign that legislation. Um, yeah, I think uh, this is really just playing to the base. Um, it, it is, it is, it's interesting to watch lemmings walk off the cliff right, yeah. behind the anti-immigrationists in, in the GOP. Uh, all Congress is doing now, the GOP Congress in the House is doing, is ensuring that they lose the presidential election in 2016. <laughs> it's, it's the only thing that's happening. DAPA and DACA are not going away, certainly not through a congressional action. I'm more concerned about the litigation that's ongoing uh, and for which there was a hearing today in federal court in Texas brought by the state attorney generals, but I was heartened a couple of days ago to see that while there was 18 attorney generals who sued Obama to stop it, there was 12 attorney generals who joined Obama to keep <laughs> it going. Um, so we'll see what that judge does. Even if he rules against the programs, uh, there's no way that the Fifth Circuit, I believe, is going to uphold that. Uh, so uh, I would not worry about that. I also, Richard, one other thing that I wanted to mention, a question I get all the time is, well, Obama's only president for two more years. What happens then? Well, first of all, I don't think a Republican can get elected unless there's immigration reform. Um, and so no Democrat's going to stop the program. But even if the worst case scenario happened for people and a Republican's elected in the context of this program and they, and they, they cancel it, do you really believe that ICE will round up 4 million people and deport them when they can't even get a hold of the 800,000 currently in the United States? No. And then one last thing, the uh, last question I get all the time. People with deportation orders do qualify for DAPA because the only thing DAPA is is a stay of deportation and a work permit. It's nothing else. So people who have orders of deportation can come forward and apply for DAPA. There you go. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I was going to move on now, changing tact a little bit to kind of the business immigration side of things. Um, Basically, 
proposals, suggestions that, that have come through and that we're, we're still kind of waiting on. Um, we were actually pretty hopeful that we were going to get this final rule on um, employment authorization document um, being allowed for H4 spouses. Um, that hasn't you mean the one that's been ready for a year? Right. The one that we're still kind of waiting to, to actually get the final thing through. I mean, I think we we're hoping it's going to be sometime in January. Do you, do you agree, Chuck? Or no, I do not. I do not think it's coming in January. I have very little faith in, <laughs> in the Obama administration on business issues. Uh, I think a lot will depend on what happens uh, over the next couple of weeks in Congress with this bill. Uh, Obama, I think at this point, is just literally poking his finger in the eye of the House. I would hope it's in, in January, but I really don't think so. I think it'll be closer to April 1. Right. And, and I mean, I'll go through that in a little bit more detail. The other ones, they, they literally gave no timeline really on. Um, this whole STEM OPT reform, which we'll go into in more detail, visa bulletin reform, um, and some other reforms to, to a couple of the other areas, such as national interest waivers, uh, potentially parole, um, perm streamlining, streamlining, which is always um, something that, that they always seem to get slightly wrong. But anyway, portability, um, naturalization, these are all kind of things that were mentioned um, and that there is kind of talk that there may be some kind of action or reform on. Um, going into the EADs for H4 spouses, this is obviously a, a big thing um, and something that a lot of people are very excited about. What this is, is basically an employment authorization document for the spouses of H1B holders. So right now, um, for some strange reason, um, if you're the spouse of an H1B non-immigrant, you cannot get an employment authorization card. Um, even though a lot of the other kind of non-immigrant status is basically, you know, L1, E3, you know, a lot of these other ones can actually have one. So far, H1B spouses cannot. Um, the proposed rule, which, as Chuck mentioned, was actually published back in May, um, so we're still kind of sitting, waiting for something like that to come through, is going to, the idea is that it would allow H4 spouses to get an employment authorization document if, and it is very, it's still very limited, this is going to be where the H1B spouse is the benef either the beneficiary of an approved I-140 petition, or beneficiary of an approved H-1B petition to extend based on AC-21. And AC-21 is a provision that basically lets um, an H-1B extend if their immigrant visa category is, is backlogged um, and either the, the PERM, the labor certification, or the I-140 has been pending for 365 days prior to the six-year max. Um, the AD applications filed on basic form I-765 Filing fee would be 380, just as as it is right now. Again, hoping to to see if this comes through. Maybe later this month, but it could be nearer to to April or in the upcoming months. STEM OPT reform. Um, this is another big thing. Basically, the idea is going to be that international students and STEM graduates will become eligible for expanded and extended usage of OPT. Now, what 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 does STEM mean? STEM refers to graduates in these particular fields, in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The idea is that the U.S. economy or the U.S. really needs these, these people, um, and we don't want to be sending these particular foreign nationals home. We want to make sure we give them every opportunity to be able to get into jobs and, and kind of benefit the U.S. economy. Now, the idea behind this would be basically the, the STEM um, OPT basically grants you as long as the employer meets certain other conditions such as E-Verify which is a, an I-9 um, employment compliance system um, they would actually grant you a 17 month extension and this is really good especially with all the problems around H-1Bs um, as many of you may be aware of the H-1Bs um, there's it's, it's one of these nasty ones right now with the lottery all because there's such a small cap on number of H-1B visas available, so many people are applying, a lot of people, even people with U.S. master's degrees, not being selected in the lottery and not being able to even get, get an H-1B. By getting this 17-month extension on your OPT, it gives you a little bit of extra time. Maybe you've got two or three chances to actually go through the lottery and, and try and get selected. Um, again, this is something that no time frame was really provided, again, maybe potentially within 180 days, 
Um, but we're kind of just waiting, waiting to see what actually happens and, and whether they're going to expand this as well. Um, maybe expand, ex expand to include some other different fields as well or um, something along those kind of lines. This, the visa bulletin reform, this is actually something that we're all very excited about. Um, if you've ever logged on to the, the website and, and looked at the visa bulletin, it can be quite confusing. Um, there's dates and numbers all in different places and it just it seems to change every single month. The idea is that Department of State is going to see if they can kind of modify this and make it a little bit simpler, but also, which is the more exciting part, there's a suggestion that maybe they're going to cease to, to count derivatives against visa numbers. This would be awesome if it's something that they actually move forward with. Um, to explain further, basically, the visa bulletin works in terms of you've got your immigrant visa approved, you're in a waiting line, you've got your number in the line, you're waiting for your number to become current, and when it becomes current, then you can move forward with the rest of your green card application. Now, right now, they're including in these certain visa, they only have a certain visa num uh, a certain number of visas each, each year. And basically, right now, they're also take, subtracting from that number any derivatives, any dependents, or this kind of thing, which would be spouse, children. There's a lot of talk that maybe this might be something that they're going to, to change, in which case a lot more people could suddenly become current. Um, the other aspect of this seems to be that they're talking about individuals with approved I-140. So the I-140 is the immigrant visa petition. That's your first, that's your employer has gone through, potentially gone through the Department of Labor requirements. They've filed an I-140 for you. It's been approved. But you're in one of these long waiting lines, particularly if you're from India or China, where they have some of the longest waiting lines. Um, in those situations, there's talk that maybe we could allow people to submit the second stage of their green card application sooner. And why this is such a good thing is this may allow if people are allowed to, to submit that second portion earlier, that second portion as part of it also includes an employment authorization document and advanced parole documents, which basically would mean that you would have your, your spouse, your dependents would have the ability to, to work during this period while everything's pending earlier. Um, and in addition, it could also, if, if you're able to file that second part of your green card stage sooner, it could mean make it easier to port to another employer. Right now, the idea is once your second stage, this AOS, this adjustment of status portion has been pending for six months, you can kind of jump to a different employer if certain circumstances are, are met. Um, if people are able to apply and actually submit their second stage earlier, then there's a good chance people would be able to switch sooner and kind of would would wouldn't run into some of the same issues that we've been seeing with employers changing and, and this kind of thing. Um, again, no time was provided. Time frame was provided on that. This, the other thing that we also found pretty exciting was this new parole. Um, the idea here is that they would have some kind of a parole. Now, parole is kind of it's it's a way of of having being granted permission to actually enter the country. Um, and it's it's kind of a strange word. A lot of people think, oh, it's related to some kind of prison or something like that. But really, it's it's more of a way of allowing you to come in and wait for an immigrant visa, or allow you to come in and and do these things that are going to be in the benefit of the United States. Now, they've been CIS has been directed to draft regulations for this new category of parole for inventors, researchers, founders. Founders of startup enterprises. So these are people potentially. This, this could even expand, ex, extend to investors, people that are going to be coming in to create jobs, that kind of thing. Which is generally, you know, obviously the, the kind of people you want to be coming in to st stimulate the economy and go down that way side of things. Um, the idea is if they've been awarded substantial U.S. investor financing or if somehow otherwise hold the promise of innovation, job creation through new technologies, pursuits of cutting-edge research, that kind of thing, 
Again, no time frame on this, but proposed rule expected sometime before the summer. Moving on, other business related actions. Um, we've covered the NIW side of things, review of perm regulations. The Department of Labor will apparently update its perm regulations um, to hopefully modernize the perm recruitment requirements for testing the labor market. The, for those of you who don't know, the perm process is very long winded and some would say very inefficient. Now, the idea is that you're applying to the, the company is recruiting for your position. If, if you're the foreign national, you're looking to get the job, they're recruiting for your position to show that there's no able, willing, and qualified U.S. workers for that position. And these are minimally qualified U.S. workers. So this is, this is kind of, if they do something, if they update it, if they modernize it in some way, could be a good sign. Other business-related actions, this would be regarding the AC21 that we talked about earlier. Um, the portability in terms of being able to jump. Now, if again, if, if we have that benefit that we, we were mentioned earlier in terms of the adjustments being filed, it's been pending for six months, you can jump to a different employer. Right now, you can only do that if, if you're going into a same or similar occupation, um, which is great, but it's always been a little bit kind of ambiguous. There hasn't really been a huge amount of explanation as to what a same or similar occupation is. So this is supposed to be supposed to come up with some kind of recommendations on this front to give us a little bit more information on, on that. The other thing that was mentioned recently was this kind of, they're going to really try and promote citizenship awareness. Um, DHS basically launched, it's supposed to be launching comprehensive citizenship awareness media campaigns, and I think there's 10 states that are particularly high in, in lawful permanent resident green card holders. Um, the idea is to really try and move as many of these people over onto, you know, into citizenship as possible, um, which we always think. They're not giving too many scholarships. <laughs> it's, right. I think it's only 10,000 people, so it's probably yeah. less than 1% of those who were going to apply, but still, it's better than nothing. It's very true, yeah. Um, and trying to expand options for paying fees, I mean, I, I think it would be great if they finally allowed payment via credit cards. Um, yeah, and, and like... Like Chuck mentioned, there's, there's talk of full or partial fee waivers on this as well. Um, well there are, are essentially no fee waivers right now. Anything they do would be very, very helpful. Definitely. Uh, this was the last thing that I was just going to mention. Um, there is a new Form I-129. The Form I-129 is the main form that we use for most non-immigrant visa petitions. Um, this the new form will actually require H-1B employers, it appears, to count all U.S. full-time equivalent employees of their company. It also has an amended attestation for the company signer. Now, when we publish, when we kind of initially publicized this webinar, we were going to go into this in more detail, but I think American Immigration Lawyers Association, the AILA, has gone in touch with USCIS, and we've kind of gone back and forth on this because there was a lot of concern that with cap season coming up April 1st, that this was going to lead to some confusion. Because you know, it was an outrageous attestation requirement, yes. it would have Definitely. Been. There was very um, few lawyers that would have signed that attestation as currently written. Right. It was, it was basically going to be that you had to sign off on saying Your that everything. Your truthfulness, exactly. Precisely, yeah. So the good news is CIS has announced, I think, last Friday that this, they postponed the effective date of this new form. So we don't need to worry about it until May 1st. Obviously, it's still there, um, still needs to um, happen, and we still need to look into it to see what changes it's going to make. But it means we don't have to particularly worry about it for the upcoming cap season. Um, and I think that was about everything that I had. Um, I was going to mention that we do have another webinar coming up, uh, February 12th, 2015, that will also go through you know, kind of updates at that point, and maybe, Chuck, maybe you might have a DACA expansion information. Well, we, we, we know it starts February 15th, we think, and uh, hopefully by February 15th we'll have the details. Wouldn't that be very nice? That please. would be great. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that's all I've got. Chuck, did you have any other Oh, uh, just the one piece of news that came out today, the Mexican consulates uh, will now begin issuing 
birth certificates in the United States. Uh, now that's not, and it's not exactly that, uh, the Mexican consulates, and this is important because uh, two-thirds of the DAPA eligible individuals are in fact Mexican nationals. Uh, it's very hard to get a Mexican birth certificate when you're not in Mexico. Right. You have to send your, your Uncle Juan or your Aunt Maria over there and you know who knows if they're going to get it and they're too lazy to get it so they go buy one and it's fake. It's, it's been a nightmare for the consulates. So the consulates are going to allow you to apply at the consulate who will then work with you and the states of Mexico electronically to get the proof of the uh, registration of birth. And then once they have the proof of registration of birth, they will give you the, pa the birth certificate. It's not a same day thing like the birth certificate, but you do need the birth certificate a passport. So it's actually a very useful, very helpful thing. And again, very foresightful. If, if our USCIS was this <laughs> foresightful, uh, we wouldn't be having many of the problems that we have today. Definitely. That's but really I, I would just say the last thing on any of these programs, stay tuned. Uh, keep looking for uh, Wall Store from Rosenthal's uh, uh, notices on these things. It, immigration law is literally constantly changing. Uh, don't give too much credit to the, to the, to the House GOP. Uh, look for the word from DHS, and uh, at the end of the day, many of these things will come to fruition. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone, for, for logging on or, or kind of listening to us today. Um, and thank you, Chuck and, and Carl, as well, for, for speaking. Um, it's a pleasure, and yeah. as always, Richard.